ông quay chụp ông ở trung đường trung đại một tổ cái tầm đại ca để tiếp tục tầm đại ca đào đại ca chuẩn từ thạ về nhà ông ta chết làm bài một tổ thuê cả thuê đây sản thản đã bọc luôn Thank you, Mr. President. When we left off, I had discussed the uh, speech by Pol Pot about killing 50 million Vietnamese, the population of Vietnam, and how that was broadcast on the radio. One of the ways that that manifested itself, the consequences of this policy and this incitement, can be seen in actions by DK troops when they cross the border and attack into Vietnam. Now these attacks and crimes outside of the territory of Cambodia are not part of the charges in this case within the scope of this trial. What they're relevant for, though, is this critical issue of intent that we've talked about and how this policy and incitement against the Vietnamese manifested itself. So while, if I understand the defense position the position is that these attacks did not occur. This has been shown in the trial, including through the testimony of a uh, expert requested by the defense, Mr. Stephen Morris. Professor Morris testified um, that on the 30th of April, excuse me, this is in his book, page 98 of his book, on the 30th of April, 1977, Khmer Rouge units attacked several villages and towns in Anyang and Chao Tok provinces of southern Vietnam, burning houses and killing hundreds of civilians. Expert witness Nayan Chanda, who testified in an earlier trial, uh, his transcripts are part of the evidence in this case, and also his book. And in his book, Brother Enemy, pages 99 to 100, he talks about a Hungarian journalist, Gandor Dura, who was taken to the border region inside Vietnam, in Thái Ninh. And China indicates that Dora witnessed ruined buildings and many dead and burned people, mainly women and children. He reported on the destruction of several villages and civilian casualties running into the hundreds. When Nayan Chanda testified in 2009, he talked about his own visits uh, to areas that have been attacked by DK troops near the border. And he said on the 25th of May, the village that I visited looked like it had been hit by a storm. Houses were destroyed and a lot of debris still lying around. I met some survivors who had told me about what happened. And I must say, I was shaken by the accounts of the atrocities that were committed during this attack. I have never heard of such brutalities perpetrated by man on women, children, innocent people. He went on to say, that is a visit which is absolutely engraved in my memory. And I even have a personal nightmare about those visits. I have never seen in my reporting career as many bodies of civilians killed most brutally and left there. And the mindlessness of this attack was most astonishing that I wondered what these people had done to merit that kind of death. And the evidence of this has even been commented on by Ki Sampan in his own book about Cambodia's recent history, E318. He wrote, the events recounted by people like Chanda are irrefutable. There is no doubt that the Khmer Rouge made forays into Vietnamese villages along the border, committing appalling crimes 
against Vietnamese civilians. And of course, Your Honors, Kiu Sampan and Nguyen Chia would know about this because they were the center center of the DK regime and there even are surviving reports from these battlefields uh, by DK units to the center. One of those is E3-243. It's a telegram dated 19 January uh, 1978. It's actually from South Pim, using his alias Chun, to Brother Paul, with copies to Uncle Nun, Nun Chia, Brother Van, Brother Vaughan, an office, an office undoubtedly being Office 870, where Q Sampan at that time would have been the only member. In paragraph one of that report, Sao Pim reports, we launched Thank you, Mr. President. So in this telegram, E3-243, from Sao Pim, that's to Pol Pot and Nun Chia and Office 870, he reports, we launched guerrilla attack in their territory two kilometers from our border. Result, we smashed 30 military houses and burned down several civilian houses. We smashed two enemy motorboats. Their people in the motorboats were all destroyed. He also reports that at 3 a.m. we continued firing Rocket 107 into Hokkaido Market. We could not grasp the result, however, we saw it was on fire. Another telegram is E3-1076. It's dated 8th of April, 1978, and it's sent by Sun Sen with his alias 47. <laughs> And in that telegram, he reports, we attacked and entered the Dong Tap Population Center and the market south of Chepang Piang and Tan Chao. We killed and wounded many hundreds of them and burned hundreds of houses. We continued to fire 107 millimeters and DK-75 into Tan Chao. The late King Father Noranam Sihanouk recalled Pol Pot telling him that the DK army was sent to, quote, to Kampuchea Krom with the mission to kill as many men, women, and children as possible of the evil race. So what we see is that around 1977, there seems to have been a decision made that no longer would there be an attempt to deport the few Vietnamese that remained in the country, but rather to kill them. Prum Sarun in Vana district in the northwest zone testified here on 8th of December 2015 that his battalion chief told him 
to report any Vietnamese in the units who would then be sent to the district and killed. Heng Le Heng from Krati Sector 505 testified on the 19th of September 2016 that his uncle was a Khmer person and whose wife was ethnic Vietnamese. The children did not speak Vietnamese, they only spoke Khmer. But all of them were collected and taken away. He said, quote, because they had a policy that people who were connected to the Vietnamese network or relationship were not spared. And, Your Honors, I have, uh, we prepared a very short video compilation of bits of testimonies that we've heard in this court from witnesses and civil parties. That is Prak Doon on the 2nd of December 2015, Chong Yang Chat, 7 December 2015, Uch Sun Le, the 2nd of March 2016, and also on the 1st of March, Heng Le Heng, 19 September 2015, Sin Chem, 14 December 2015, and finally, Pak Sok on 16 December 2015. So if that could just be played to remind us of some of the testimony we've had about how the Vietnamese were treated. អង្គការបានកន្ទិចហើយហើយក៏បានប្រទុសពៀកខ្ញុំមិនបានថាយកពូអីពីដើមឡើយក៏មិនយកអីដែងប្រព័ន្ធខ្មែរមិនបានពូ
cứ trời tại cập tịch chào ba mình chẳng tế này chôn chôn màu nâng chứ bác chìa nẹ tầng ổ nâng tầng hôn cầm lăng ai biết cầm tịch chào ơn tiền anh chẳng á nên chỉ cầu ca bằng cái cây lượng chẳng nên do bà phuôn bà phuôn hôn do tầng quay chào do tầng con tầng bà phuôn do tầng quay chào ở đây là ốc nâng trông bà hãy do tầng bạc bạn không nhầm về nơi khu vực mà tập con ai nữa ai ai do nó hả How did you know and let me let me go back to something when if if a mixed couple uh, with the Vietnamese wife, um, if the wife was Vietnamese and she was taken away, what happened to the children? How many of the Vietnamese people in your commune were taken away and killed, Madam Witness? Batam Cham Lai Sua Tau Chom Chiet Viet Nam Dau Lu Tuk No Bat ແລະពីការដៃនោះគឺជាទាហានក្រៅពីនោះជាអាប្រជាជនតែសួរតាតៅណាវាថាទៅរត់ទៅ Were they, did they have any arms or attempt to resist arrest? Do you remember any, a baby being among that group? Do you remember if there was a, an infant? ចាំខ្ញុំនឹងពេលយកដល់ផែអូជាទៀលនោះឃើញថាក្មេងនោះមានការយំស្រែកយ៉ាងខ្លាំងដោយមកដែរវាចាប់ចងក្រោយមកវ
which you'll see on the screen, smashed 100 ethnic humans, including small and big, adults and children. Finally, Your Honors, um, the treatment of this small Vietnamese community that remained at the end of the regime, 1977-78, is also shown through the records of the center's own security center, S21, operating under the um, command of Nguyen Chia. We can have slide number four. This is taken from our, uh, our final trial brief, <coughs> Annex F2. It indicates Vietnamese arrested by month and sent to S21. And as you can see, there is a huge spike that begins in early 1978, the Vietnamese brought in. And if we can see the next slide, please, this shows how in S21, the authorities there describe the Vietnamese prisoners. There's a total records that we have uh, identified of 728 individuals identified as Vietnamese, approximately 34.9% were classified as soldiers, a much bigger number, 49% as civilians. Prak Khan, you recall, was one of the interrogators at S21, and he testified last year about one particular incident where a Vietnamese family was brought in. You can play the next video, please. ແລະກາຍາໄລគេໃຫ້ໃຫ້ຫນັງ <coughs> một đại bú hay nâng đội tây có bán tiền câu nâng chanh thì đai ở phố nâng nom đai ở phố nâng châu đầu nồng pro nồng cà già lai đài sầm rạp cọt chua nâng chanh chanh một cào hay bật thuê chết tấu cổ Chanh một hàng cao mà do một một cái đây một nắng tầm lạ cô nắng một đây nhom đâu thì cao nắng của khơi lạ máu của slap tàu ấy bằng chia nhom bọ đây ở nhom do tập cọp cho đâu hàng tập bôn tàu Your Honor, one of the things we learned from the testimony of the cadre from S21 is that children were not normally registered. Their photos weren't taken and their names were taken down they were brought into S21. So the surviving records that we have, we simply do not reflect accurately the number of children that were taken to S21 and executed around, in and around S21. But there are some surviving records of children of Vietnamese ethnicity. You can show the next slide. We showed this, uh, my colleague showed this this morning talking about S21. Again, there are not many pictures that survive. This is a 13-year-old Vietnamese girl from Spain. We entered S21 in May 1978, along with her brother, who was five years younger than her. He was only eight years old. And her father, who was listed on the records of S21 as doing rice in Sphere. This young girl, Vien Thi Nhok, is one of uh, 16 Vietnamese children between the ages of 13 and 15 who appear in the records of S21 that survive, the records that survive. If we can go to the next slide, 
asam jol tu slide. In the oh, the bantua. records, excuse me, should be slide seven. Yes, in the records of S21, no, there are seven children pay, mui, mien, kumai, kumai, between the ages of ten and eleven do, years do, old. Do, seven do, Vietnamese do, children. Do, so do, here's do, one of Vietnam. these Vietnamese children, Li Yang Ve. Li He's number six hundred and ten. Uh, excuse me. He's number one two five nine zero on the OCIJ list. This photo is number six ten from the more recent collection that DC Cam brought uh, shared with us. He was from the Southwest Zone. He entered S21 on the 12th of October, 1978. The other young children are listed in the footnote number, brief, footnote number 2303 on our final brief. And among them is another eight-year-old girl, Mien Timmy Pong. She's number 12697 on the OCIJ list. And there's also two seven-year-old boys who are listed. One of them, again, we don't have photographs that survive from these children. One of them, um, Trong Yang Phak, he was entered S21 on the 30th of October, 1978, and the next day he was executed. He's described by S21, seven-year-old, as a Vietnamese spy. As was another seven-year-old boy, Trong Nam Nhoc. He's number 12660 on the OCIJ list. Your Honours, if we can go back to the next slide, go to the next slide. It's E3-4604. It's a copy of the Revolutionary Flag magazine from April 1978. And this talks about the success of the policy sweeping clean the Vietnamese. It indicates that now, how about Yuen? There are no Yuen in Kachin territory. Formerly, there were nearly one million of them. Now, there is not one seed of them to be found. While most of the Vietnamese were transported out of Cambodia in the early years of the regime, the policy, as I said, involved the killing the few that remained, many or perhaps most of them being simply people of mixed blood or married to Khmer spouses. Those killings constitute genocide. It was an attempt to destroy the Vietnamese ethnic group in Cambodia as such. So I would now like to move on and talk about the Cham people. In the Cham, the story of what happened to the Cham is a different history than what happened to the Vietnamese. It differs in several respects. We can go back to the definition of genocide. If we can have that slide put up again. slide. We call that genocide is defined as certain acts such as killing members of the group with the intent to destroy and hold in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. One of the issues that is still developing in international law and judgment, I believe, will be critical to the further development of this international law and genocide. What do these words as such mean? It's a fundamental principle of statutory construction, interpreting any law, that all words in the statute are presumed to have a meaning. They're not put there for no purpose. So what does it mean, let's just take religious group, to destroy a religious group as such? Why did they add the words as such? Well, we submit that a religious group, for example, is a group of people that have in common a faith, they practice, they have certain beliefs that they share, they practice their religion together. If you stop these people from practicing their religion, the group does not, no longer exists. The individuals may exist, 
but you have destroyed the religious group as such. And there are various ways you can do that. Some of them would amount to genocide and some would not. If you simply, for example, close schools down, that may be persecution, but it is not genocide. But if, as part of your policy, you kill members of the group, that's one of the five genocidal acts. That is genocide. If you kill members of the group with the intent to destroy in whole or in part the group as such, you committed